real questions, real answers for real life. Come on in and pull up a chair. You're at 1850 Main Street with Michael Del Giorno and David Zanotti. Not many people think Joe Biden is up for another four years. Does anyone even think he's up for the strains of a campaign? Let's talk about it today. So this is what I want to know. The guy can't hardly get up and down Air Force One. Now, the last time they, they had this, I mean, first off, he was stronger several years ago. I mean, he could he could hold the ice cream cone up. He could ride the bicycle. And he could talk to a, a empty parking lot with 12 cars beeping their horns at him. I mean, it, okay, because it was in the middle of COVID. Everybody had an excuse for everything to be weird. Nobody judged it. How in the world does he pull this off this time in regards to a campaign? How, how does he do it? I would answer first by saying, um, you know, I think the first time around they hit him in a basement and they had COVID conveniently to do it. Sure. I guess if somebody was a real conspiracy oriented person, you'd say, oh, they're going to come up with something. I don't think that's the case. I don't think they need to. There's nothing about Joe that surprises anybody. In other words, I used to always say no impression is better than a bad impression. It's already such a bad impression. Nothing could make it worse. So if he falls down the stairs, he just fell down the stairs again. If he jumbles words again and says something stupid, he jumbled words. I mean, everybody knows who Joe is. You don't have anybody enthusiastically voting for him because they think they're going to make their life better. So I don't think it hurts them any more than the, the way he has been incapable of performing in his presidency. I actually go somewhere different in that every time they're in a pinch, Governor Brown in California, Ted Kennedy, I wouldn't go Al Sharpton or Jesse Jackson. I'm trying to think who else would have been a big name at the time you needed to do something to beat H.W. Bush, who showed himself a little vulnerable after the war. And they don't go to that. They go to an unknown charismatic governor riddled in scandal in Bill Clinton. When we come around again, who do they go to? Barack Obama, a community organizer from Chicago. State senator. With a very, very mysterious personal background, a, a short-term state senator in Illinois, and then a United States senator for 60 days, all driven by a great speech at a convention. And he's walking in the White House a year later. Only served in the United States Senate less than 60 days before he began his campaign. I don't know. I think the writing on the wall with Podesta is that it's not going to be a big name. It's going to be limp in with Biden, hand it to the governor of Maryland. Whether you have dumped Kamala at the convention or by way of running RFK as a third party, you know, to sneak Biden in. I think that's the play. And, and I'll tell you, the only thing I'm asking you to stretch yourself is, do you agree with me that when you think Podesta and Soros are finally desperate, out of time, out of hope, or out of wisdom and are suddenly getting stupid? Or do you presume they're five steps ahead of us and we better sit and drink coffee till we figure it out? <laughs> because unless I lose you there, I would reverse the question to you this way. You give me the scenario that Joe Biden, in his current or even worse condition, loses. Well, that brings us on to the subject that we don't want to talk about. I mean, we don't like talking about it together. We don't like to talk about it when anybody can overhear it. And that's the question of who the Republicans nominate and what's reality out there in regards to people's willingness to support who, whom, which ticket, which party, et cetera. How do the Republicans move into this process and take this guy on. You said earlier that there's, you know, this is Jimmy Carter, but there's there's no Ronald Reagan. And I'm trying to think back. I also said it's LBJ and he doesn't have the sense to not run. Yeah. Which is a um, problem for his party. But there there is not a consensus candidate on the Republican side. For the Republicans to win the presidency, everything's got to go right. Um, they have really got to have a consensus candidate, which which brings together their entire coalition, and they have to be able to make a presentation to the nation that is genuinely substantive, but they also need a highly deficient person to be running against. Now, they had that highly deficient person in Hillary. No, I'm just laughing because I'm, I'm wondering if... I, it's, a, it's a very long filibuster. 
But can you give me a scenario that the Republicans can beat Joe Biden? Because if you're going to use Reagan, Ray, don't forget, Reagan's only half the story. They weren't behind Reagan because of amnesty along the border. What solidified the party was when they added Bush to Reagan, which begs the question, if you could join DeSantis and Trump, you might unify the party. But nobody sees that happening. You have to have something to beat something. You can't beat something with nothing. Now, it seems to defy the imagination that a, a candidate that is as diminished as Joe Biden couldn't be defeated by a dozen different Republican candidates. This isn't the county fair. This isn't a, 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 a student council election. Okay, this is a situation where you have billions of dollars behind the Biden machine orchestrated through a network of, of massive corporate players uh, and where George Soros and John Podesta play a very big role as ringleaders in all of this. Look at the money that's coming into Biden right now. Look at what's going on from Hollywood. Look at what's going on from major corporations, Silicon Valley, et cetera. They've got a game. They, they, they've got serious game. They put up kind of a weekend at Bernie's situation the first time around. They're not afraid to do it twice. Mm -mm. That point, I think you're exactly right on. And that's where I think the Republicans have radically underestimated this situation. And there is no Ronald Reagan. There's nobody who's going to beat Joe Biden and have the race declared and the concession speech at 830 in the evening. This is the, those days are gone. So the question is, you to answer that question, you got to move to the general election. And right now, the polling numbers do not show uh, that there's anybody on the Republican side that blows away the Democrat nominee. There's just there's there's just no dominance. There's no dominant character on the horizon, especially on an electoral college map and especially an electoral college map where there's two things that the Republicans still have not figured out since Obama how to catch up on. One is the necessity of social media. And, and the second is early voting, how to capture both those things. It's not. And I know people are who are they're thinking to themselves, yike. I mean, uh, uh, give me some hope. Give me some hope because I don't want Joe Biden to be president again. Well, you got to come up with a candidate. That's the first part of it. So what ends up happening is you got millions of people out there of, of genuine goodwill, and they want to see a better president for the United States, but they're completely dependent upon the Republican Party infrastructure. So how does that infrastructure match up with the Soros Podesta machine and all of their? Who's coming in on the Republican side? to make big cultural influences and bring in big dollars. Who is it? Well, well, Trump's an outsider. Yeah. But by the way, the, like you said, it comes down to the general. All right. So let's say it's Trump, right? Mm -hmm. There's uh, th that would make 36 percent ish at the highest of the Republican Party ecstatic. Mm -hmm. they, they, he's bigger than the game. He's bigger than the party. I get uh, it. They don't like sure. anybody but him. And nobody's got that close. I mean, th he's still got the biggest number. Even if you get Trump, he lost four years ago. And you still have, what, 64% of the party and about 26 of that 46% that don't want Trump. They'll stay at home. So that's a problem. If Trump is gone, what do the 36% that worship him do? Are they enthusiastic to get behind DeSantis yeah. or yeah. somebody like that? So See, this th has got to be what, Sor what uh, Soros and Podesta are saying. Yeah, they know, they know that the Republicans can't get there. And by the way, let me remind everybody of something. And you were consulting these people, so I know you know. As great as Ronald Reagan is, and he and JFK, actually JFK wasn't in my lifetime, but close enough to my lifetime that I've made it a life study. They're my two best presidents. Reagan didn't do it alone. That convention was split over Reagan and H.W. Bush. And what they were able to do was unite the party. So they created a super consensus candidate with the two top running and put them together mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. Reagan on top. That's what made them a landslide, unless you're going to put DeSantis and Trump together, you can't get the numbers you need in the general to be a threat to Podesta. You can run Biden weak. You can always switch out Kamala with RFK or the governor in Maryland. You can throw somebody in as an independent to do a Ross Perot effect. You got a lot of plays, none of which you're going to need because you and I are sitting here. We can't even brainstorm a way Biden's going to struggle. OK, but so the question is, what if he does? What if in the next six months, what if in the next eight months, something does happen that takes him out of play? He's just not able to do it. Well, now now you're to where, where I was in that, remember the last time they were in, a two last two times they were in a big jam. 
They turned to Bill Clinton, a scandalous governor in an obscure state like Arkansas. So you say they're going to the Maryland guy. They're going to the Maryland guy. You bet your, okay. you bet your sweet right. baby. He is Barack Obama with no mystery. Did you and a, say you bet your sweet bet baby? Your I have sweet never heard you say that in before. my life. You have betrayed. Were you one of those children in footy pajamas that was watching <laughs> laughing? Come tell the truth. One you were watching. Ringy ding. Laffin you were was watching laughing. Saka to me, saka to me. Yes. Oh my gosh. Okay, we just alienated anyone that would ever overhear this conversation in this entire place. Yes, I use sweet bippy. Michael began in talk radio over 30 years ago. David has been working in the field of public policy and media for over 40 years. They've been around and seen a lot. To learn more about Michael and David, visit 1850MainStreet.com. So the next question that, that I've got to answer so I can get some sleep at night is knowing this play at the top, which is way, way, way behind the curtain. I mean, there's a lot of play going on, and I don't think anyone in the media is there. I don't think I think it is extremely elite, way back behind the curtain. The only way that the American people can protect themselves is to understand the game that's being played on the ground, whether it's ballot issues or congressional seats or Senate seats. Because whatever they come up with, if the Democrats, in fact, pull off the White House, they're still going to need a House and a Senate. And they don't have the House. And there's a chance they may not get the Senate. So that's why they, I guess this is two birds with one stone for them. They're going to go ahead and go way down the party structure, go into the states, go into the districts, run the, the, try to run this campaign from the bottom up. So they get, at least they get a Congress, because with a Congress, then it, it's not that big a deal. But if they don't get the Congress, if they don't get the House and they lose the Senate, now we're right back at stalemate. And then their next play is simply they got to wait four more years to see what happens because nothing's going to happen. Right. So that means that the most important vote a person's going to cast in this coming election is going to be for House and Senate. The most important involvement somebody can be is to get people that they believe in elected, no matter where they are in the country, into the House and into the Senate, because what's going to matter is Congress, period. Can I ask you a question? If you're John Podesta, and you're George Soros. I'm a very large person if I'm two of them together. No, but, but wouldn't you- And I have you, a lot of money if I was both of them combined together. <laughs> would you want to maintain the presidency for four more years and have a split Congress? Would that be, I mean, beyond their wildest dreams, would be maintain the Senate, get control of the House, and keep the presidency? But I think they're- Excellent question. Yeah, I think they're fine with the split and the presidency. It depends, though, because they've got a play going right now across the media on the MAGA Supreme Court. They've been they've been now they've been libeling the Supreme Court. They're trying to get them on ethics stuff. They're trying to pass ethics legislation. Some people are talking about impeaching people. Now they're calling it. There's a cry out from a couple of college professors, uh, one in San Francisco, I forget what the other one's from, that's calling for the president to ignore the Supreme Court because, quote, it's not a normal court. That's what Biden said. Mm. So they're calling it a MAGA court, and basically now they're trying to turn the Supreme Court into the electoral issue. That being the case, if Podesta and Soros are successful enough to win the Congress, then they do need a very incapacitated president who will take whatever nominee they tell them. I mean, you could actually see the situation where if the Democrats get the House and the Senate, they could turn, and, and Biden's still president, I, I would think they'd put Merrick Gar Garland into the Supreme Court. They still have that play up their sleeve, yeah. Yeah. I, I, both... It seems to me that both parties are weak at the top of the ticket. Yeah. That's that's hard to believe because it seemed like the Republicans couldn't come up with enough good, fresh, potential, experienced faces to step into the situation if it was an open election. The assumption was Biden wouldn't make it through and have a second term. Now, it's I mean, it's I know it's TikTok, it's it's time is ticking and no one and no one's wishing any one of these people ill health or ill will it's it, we can't do that we can't go there no 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 yeah under any circumstances we can't go there that's not ethical but let's face it i mean joe's given us every tell you can possibly ask for that he's really not in a position to be able to continue to govern and the one tell he's not giving us is that he cares he's he's going to hold on to this no matter what I, that's so as long as he holds on i, I think we got a problem with the guy with the big blue plane 
is still in the game. So you got to find the enthusiasm somewhere. You find it in abortion on demand. You find it in the Supreme Court. You find it in the LGBTQ issue. You find it in marijuana. You find it in gambling. You find it anywhere you can. You find it in a key Senate race or you find it in a key House race. Um, That's easy to buy, too, because you can do a, a, um, a Stacey Abrams model in 50 key House districts. You just go down and pour down half a million dollars in those 50 key races and, and you pass it around at the local level, those people are going to are, are going to be very excited about that, very loyal to move up the line. Yeah, you could you could push all that money down and, isn't that, and, and try to win it from the top or from the bottom up. But aren't, aren't we seeing that in the ABC story? Aren't we seeing that in the Washington Post story? Well, you know what? It is a huge tell. It was completely missed by the Matrix media. Uh, it just it, it it was out there, and it's almost like uh, it, it's weird. It's like they wanted to tell you. So you couldn't say that you were, should have been surprised because they'll say, oh, no, no, we told you this the whole way back in July and August of 2023. This is where we were going. So the moral of the story is protect your interests from the bottom up. Moral of the story is if, if, the, if the Republicans don't have good candidates in these House and Senate races, they're going to get throttled because the money's now coming to them. Yeah, the other moral of the story is if you don't have enthusiasm at the top of your ticket, you got to create it elsewhere. I think, you know, this is the hardest thing I would say to you. If we're talking about the court, who's going to respond? Because lack of enthusiasm affects money and affects turnout. Grass tops and grassroots and get out. That's the two top and the bottom of what makes elections tick. If I'm betting, and trust me, I may be an independent, but I want either DeSantis or Trump to win this election, personally. I'm concerned because the left's hatred and disrespect for the court is liable to translate into more dollars and more turnout than the pro-Constitution, pro-Declaration of Independence, conservative and Republicans. And I could say the same for abortion. I don't have to tell you that when it comes to if I had everybody's checks books here stacked up like in Bruce Almighty, who gives more? Those that want abortion versus those who want to save lives. I would say advantage them, advantage them if they can make it about issues, certainly advantage them if they can make it about a third party candidate. Boy, this is really a hopeful conversation. I'm really glad I showed up here today to have this cup of coffee with you and talk like this. <laughs> um, all right. Having said all that, what's the most positive thing? Oh, oh, no, you ask me after you go ahead and rain on the entire parade across the entire nation and dash everyone's hope that, that there's going to be an end to this regime. I'm not. I'm not negative. I'm a realist. Mm -hmm. Well, we always said one big uh, one big shining star could be if. Donald Trump could learn from the previous Donald Trump and be a Donald Trump 2.0. I don't see that. I'm going to tell you that the truth of the matter is, in, in my opinion, I cannot find a hole in the logic from experience uh, of the, all that we've lived through with all these different campaigns and players. I think we're, we're seeing where they're going. Um, and they've been very effective when they've made major shifts. It's funny because the Republicans always fight the Democrats based on the last war. And the, and, the, and the Democrats are always on to the next thing. This is a clear tell that they're on to the next thing. They're going to the bottom. Always. They're, they're going to the bottom. So the only answer is for... Now, there's one, one small piece of hope, and it goes back to the earlier conversation we had with some of this polling, particularly the Pew Research poll. In the last congressional election, in the off-off election year, the total vote count uh, in the House and Senate races, all congressional races, the total vote counts in the House where it's the most it's the most accurate real poll that you can get based on pure vote counts. More people voted for Republican candidates than voted for Democrat candidates. So if I'm a Republican and I'm not, I'm looking at that saying we have a base of support at the bottom. The problem is right now it appears that all of the Republican interest is at the top. Mm -hmm. They're in the management game and the other guys are on the shop floor. If the Republicans can't get to the shop floor and see this, they're liable to get ambushed again by what they didn't see coming. And don't forget, they used COVID as a tactic to change laws without going through legislatures and to create the early voting and mail-in voting, much of which is still intact and still their advantage. I'll say this. I want to end on a, on a, on a positive note. I think, just as I've used examples of the past, Podesta's past, Soros's past, the use of Bill Clinton, 
uh, the use of Barack Obama. Uh, I can use the Republicans past. And I can tell you that if Donald Trump would change his address and if they would run a reasonable, spirited campaign, in other words, Trump would have to stop refusing to be a part of debates, be a part of debates, not beat everybody else down, not make it about him, but make it about the country, make it about the party to where there could be a real strong group behind Trump, which there is at 36 percent, grow from 20 to 40 percent, the unanimous support for DeSantis, and then unite the two in a ticket. Well, then you'd be role modeling Reagan and H.W. Bush, and that did win against Jimmy Carter. And if Joe Biden is Jimmy Carter or LBJ, minus a third party candidate, that should be good enough. Question is, will they be smart enough to do that? But that, that's a scenario that would work. The conversations are just getting started. To get connected, check out 1850mainstreet.com. We don't data mine anyone or sell your information. Subscribe today so you don't miss a single conversation. We'll see you next time here at 1850 Main Street.